this morning. We're going to take a substantial amount of time right now to talk about the Free Methodist Way. I know that many of you have already seen this. It's come out for a while. We've been writing articles on it uh, that have been in light and life um, since January. So it began in January. We rolled it out over the first six months of the year. We, uh, we have some brochures, and I think we've got enough for everybody. So if you don't have a brochure, some of you have already picked them up. But if you don't have a brochure, would you just lift your hand? And by the way, we have them in English and Spanish. So we can give you either one, whichever one you need. So if you'll keep your hands up, we've got some people right now that are passing them out. Let me say also to our elders and uh, or, or CMCs if you're the pastor of a church. If you're a lead pastor of a church, we also have the Free Methodist Way book. And I think we should have enough for all of the elders and lead pastors. So um, these are out in the lobby. They're at the end. I think they're on this end on a, on a cart. We would love for you to take one. This includes all of the articles that were written in Light and Life over those first six months. So it includes the lead article from the, the bishops and two additional articles from other people in our movement. Uh, so there's three articles for each of the five values of the Free Methodist Way, and that's, that's this. And, and also, Light and Life Communications has done a great job of putting this together. They've also added small group questions. Uh, these are being used around the country in small group studies. Pastors are doing sermon series on them and also doing small groups around them. So it's a really helpful resource for the Free Methodist Way document. Let me just say as well, by the way, Light and Life Communications just was awarded um, the, the best denominational uh, communications department in the country. And uh, so... We're proud of our team at uh, headquarters, and they've done a great job putting this together as well. Now, I want you to hold on to that, because we're going to get to it in a few minutes, but that's not where I'm going to start. I want to start by um, sharing something. Uh, people, people that know me well have, have laughed that um, I, I talk about this book a lot. It's, there's a book that was written called uh, A Failure of Nerve. It's by Edwin Friedman. And I want to share with you what Edwin Friedman... Edwin Friedman was... Um, uh, well, he was, a, he was a Jewish rabbi, and then he became a marriage and family therapist, and then he began to study systems. And he, he started seeing these patterns over and over again. And so he, he came up with this... It was based on some earlier teaching, but he came up with this uh, way of describing what he called anxious systems. And an anxious system can be a family, it can be a church, or he said it could even be a nation. An anxious system, he said, is characterized always by several characteristics. Let me just walk through these one at a time. The, the first one, and this is on the overhead too, if we can go ahead and bring that up. Um, these characteristics should be there. The first characteristic of an anxious system is reactionary behavior. Reactionary behavior. What, we're, what he describes here is an emotionally charged environment where it's usually driven by fear, but an emotionally driven, uh, charged environment where everyone is reacting to one another quickly out of emotion rather than thinking through things deeply together. No one's listening to anybody. Everybody's talking at each other. It's a reactionary system. Uh, he didn't write about this, but it's something I've also heard about recently. How many of you have heard about the amygdala hijack? Anybody heard about that? The amygdala, the amygdala is it's a God thing, really. I mean, God created us as human beings um, so that if we're in real danger, uh, the information goes directly to our amygdala, and typically information comes to the amygdala, which is the emotional center of the brain, and then it goes to the logical center, and it usually takes about 10 seconds, which is really interesting, uh, because your mother used to tell you when you were really angry, count to 10, right? 
I mean, it's an it's a, it's a incredible observation here, but it takes about 10 seconds usually to get from the amygdala to the logical processing centers of the brain. But when there's real danger, like when you see a snake, the amygdala doesn't let the, uh, the, the information go to your logic center. It just reacts emotionally so that all of your energies go toward getting away from the danger. Well, what people have discovered is that sometimes the amygdala hijacks information and, and we begin to react out of emotion rather than logic. That's what's happening in a reactionary system. Everybody is reacting to each other instead of listening and learning from each other, right? The second characteristic, and we, are we getting this up on the, on the screen? We should have this on the screen by now, so if we can get that up. The second one is herd mentality. Herd mentality. So the herd mentality, language today, we might use the word polarization. Uh, it's, it's, the herd mentality is when there, I mean, think about a literal herd, and when a lion runs out of the, uh, the, the, the bush and, and begins to chase the antelopes, they all herd together, right? They come in together because there's a sense of safety in the herd. And anything that's outside of the herd becomes a target, right? And so everybody herds in, and, and, and you're all in this one enclosed uh, environment called the herd. Well, the thing about the herd is that the herd is, is all oriented together towards anything that's perceived to be a threat. Um, and, and it does not allow information in. No information comes in because we're in this posture of, of, of herding and protecting ourselves. Um, the second thing is that anybody that's outside of the herd is seen as an enemy. And, and so anybody that's not in the herd is against the herd. That's the way the herd mentality works. Uh, and, and so what happens is that these herds, when, he says when a family herds, for example, this often happens in, in, in an alcoholic home, for example. Uh, some of us grew up in alcoholic homes, and, and you know this. Uh, the herd usually revolves around the most dysfunctional member because everybody's trying to control the most dysfunctional member. And so everybody kind of uh, orients toward that member. And everybody is, all, all everybody is doing inside of the herd is trying to keep things from falling apart and blowing up. And so everything herds inside. Um, there's a tendency as well for any, if anyone inside the herd challenges any of the, the, the notions of the herd, any of the belief system of the herd, that person is immediately shunned and thrown out of the herd because the, the worst threat to the herd is someone who's not in agreement. Now, think about that. So in a family or in a church, I mean, I think that's what Paul was dealing with in 1 Corinthians when he had these little, he had these small herds of people. This herd was loyal to Peter and this herd was loyal to Paul and this one to Apollos. And, and, and what herds typically do is rather than trying to join forces or learn from each other, they demonize each other. The, the way that you can just completely dismiss another group is to demonize that group so that everything that's associated with that group is seen as negative. And then you don't have to deal with anything that the group has to say. That's the herd mentality. The third thing is blame displacement. Blame displacement. With blame displacement is the refusal to look within and acknowledge any measure of personal responsibility. Uh, it leads to a, 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 an obsession with victimization. Uh, with the blame mentality or the blame displacement, somebody outside of us is responsible for the problem. I'm not ever responsible. We're not responsible. It's somebody out there that's responsible for the problem. Uh, they cause the problem. They should fix the problem. So blame displacement, always looking to push the blame to someone else. The last one is a quick fix mentality. Quick fix mentality, I, I would describe it as um, uh, an obsession with simplistic responses to complex issues. Uh, maybe one of the best ways to describe this graphically is to think about a tree. 
If you see a tree and there's fruit on this tree, let's call it an apple tree. So you've got an apple tree and, and there's fruit that's on the tree, but there's also roots that go deep under the ground. Well, if you've got a problem with the apples, we tend to get focused on the apples and, and we put all of our attention toward the apples that are not healthy or not good. Uh, but the truth is, until you get down into the root system, it's, it's what's causing the, the unhealth that the fruit level is an unhealthy root system. And the only way to really solve the problem at the fruit level is to deal with the issues at the root level. But in an anxious system, nobody wants to get to the root level. Everybody gets consumed with the fruit. And everybody's focused on the symptoms Everybody's focused on the symptoms, and there's no patience or perseverance to get down to the roots. Now, the fourth thing that he said, the fifth, there's a fifth characteristic, and he says it's a lack. In this case, it's something that's missing. The first four are all characteristics of things that are present. The fifth characteristic is something that's missing. And he says that what's missing in an anxious system is self-differentiated leadership. So what's required in an anxious system is that somebody has to be very, very clear about who he or she is so that they're not overly influenced by the group, but also willing to come into the group because they're not afraid of, of, of what's going to happen when they get there. That's why the book's called Failure of Nerve. It takes a lot of nerve to be a self-differentiated leader. But a self-differentiated leader, let's back up from there. We're not there yet. So let's go back to the very beginning. A self-differentiated leader is a leader who knows who he or she is and knows the mission and is able to bring the group back to a place of real identity and mission. What happens when a group becomes anxious is that there is no sense of mission. Everything is turned inward. But the self-differentiated leader says, hey, this is who we are, and this is where we're going. I think about Jesus uh, in the upper room. Hours before he's going to die, he knows that this upper room is filled with people, and it's about to be an anxious system. Because everybody in there is about to be freaking out over the fact that Jesus has just told them, I'm not going to be with you any longer. I'm going back to my father. You're going to be without me in the present, in the physical. And it says there at the very beginning, knowing where he had come from and where he was going, Jesus took on a towel. And he served his disciples. Knowing where he had come from, knowing who he was, son of God, knowing where he was going, back to the Father to intercede and to continue leading my church from the throne. He knew who he was. He knew where he was going. That's what's required in an anxious system. Now, here's what's fascinating. This book was written in 1995. You might have thought it was written last year because everything that he describes, we just lived through, right? Right? Now, we may have disagreements about what caused it or, or what, what we should have done to fix it, but I don't think anybody here will disagree that, the, that our whole nation has been an anxious system for some time. We see all of these characteristics so clearly. And, uh, and unfortunately, the church has been sucked right into it. Uh, we've seen anxious systems in churches all across the country. Uh, I'm speaking now broadly, but I'm not saying that this is not true of us because it is. I mean, I'm just going to shoot really straight with you and tell you we've had, we've had anxious churches all across the nation in our movement and outside of our movement. We, we've seen people leaving, going away, immediately, reacting, getting out. We've seen herds happening inside. I've had pastors tell me in, in, the, in the same day, I got emails that said, if you're not wearing masks, I'm not coming to church. And if you're wearing masks, I'm not coming to church. And pastors have been dealing with this for over a year. Is herds inside the church demanding, if you don't do what I want, then I'm leaving. And, and so many of your churches have experienced what I'm talking about. Um, our denomination has experienced some of that. 
But here's the grace of God. The grace of God is that before COVID began, as we came into this role as bishops, we, we spent some time together for a week in January of 2019. I'm sorry, 2020. So January of 2020, we spent a week together, and we were just prayerfully saying, what, what can we bring to our denomination to help lead us forward? And we essentially said, we, we really need to work on two things. We need to work on our identity as free Methodists and clarity around our mission and, and staying focused on our mission. Oh, so we began pre-COVID working on what is now called the free Methodist way. But COVID gave us a gift. Now, I know COVID has, in a lot of ways, is not a gift. And many of you lost loved ones and friends. I'm not saying as a whole it was a gift. But there were some gifts in it. And one of those gifts was because we couldn't travel, we spent hours and hours together every week working through not only the Free Methodist Way, but a whole mission statement for the denomination that we're work, still working through, but getting close to being ready to roll out. But it was happening all in the midst of this anxious system, right? So what I want to share with you today, first of all, let me just say this about the mission. Mike talked about this last night, and I just want to reiterate it. It is critically important that we as Free Methodists not lose sight of Jesus, number one. Jesus is our Lord. There is no politician who can take that place. Jesus is our Lord. And our mission is the kingdom of God. I mean, I just want to say this. This is so important for us as Free Methodists. We must be a people who are consumed with the kingdom. I'm not saying by that that we shouldn't be involved in politics. Of course we, we should. We should be active, and, and we should bring Christian values to the political process. Now, we should support candidates that we think will, will support Christian values. But here's where there's a very important clarification. We want to, to bring that, we want to be engaged in that, but that's not our mission. Because our mission is not to get America to embrace Christian values. Now, would America be better off if it did? Absolutely. But that's not our mission. Because if we simply try to get America to embrace our values, number one, how in the world can people who don't know Jesus live out the values of the Christian life without the Holy Spirit? I think our first priority is to reach them and to bring them to Jesus. And then when the Holy Spirit is in them, guess what's going to happen? The values are going to start coming out. We, we have turned this around. We've turned people who are not Christians into enemies. And we've, we've fallen into this battle of fighting with people who don't agree with our values, but they also don't know our Jesus. And if we stay up here and fight about values... We'll never reach them because they're, they're, it's, it's a herd situation. They'll never respond. We've got to reach them first. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. So I want to say to us, let's get radically focused on our mission, which is to reach the lost and make disciples. And let's trust the Holy Spirit to do all that transforming work that will come as, as we do this together. So staying focused on our mission. But the second part of it was our identity. And here was the place, this was our first priority. And part of the reason is that we would, you know, as we, in those first few months, went around the country and talked to Free Methodists, we kept hearing a couple of things. Uh, one, and it's interesting because they're two different things, but they both point to the same problem. One thing that we heard from a lot of people that we talked to, especially young people, like at Asbury Seminary, when I would meet with uh, students there who were free Methodists, I said, well, what, you know, how are you doing as free Methodists here? And, and, and the response was, well, I, we don't really know who we are. We don't know what it means to be free Methodists. Now, the Anglicans can tell you who they are. Uh, you know, the Wesleyans can tell you who they are. And we're not really sure who we are. I mean, we, we, we love the kingdom, but... We don't really know what makes us distinct as free Methodists. 
The other thing that we heard was people saying, well, this is what it means to be free Methodist. And it was a part of the story, but not the whole. And the idea there was, we are only about justice, or we are only about this or that, whatever the word may be. And it's like the whole movement is about this one thing. And we said, that's a problem, because we're not just that. We're, we're, we're more than that. So we began to, to sense the importance of writing this Free Methodist Way document. Uh, what we hope it leads to is what I'm going to walk you through in this next um, graphic. If we can bring up that next graphic. Uh, I want you to understand what we're calling here the, a kingdom charism. It's a gift. It's, uh, charism means gift. It is the idea that God has raised up movements and giving those, given those movements certain gifts that are especially valuable to the kingdom as a whole. It's kind of like the body of Christ. You know how Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12, the body of Christ? And he says, you know, every part is different. Every part brings a unique contribution to the whole. We usually think about that in terms of a local church and all the different gifts in your local church. I think we can also think about it in terms of the kingdom, that different movements bring a different gift to the kingdom as a whole. We don't all, we're not all called to be exactly the same. But there is a, there's an important balance here that we have to live in. And the balance is, go to the next slide. These, the, the two, uh, on, on, the hor on the vertical side is a kingdom identity. And on the v horizontal uh, axis is the faith tribe identity. So what we're saying here is that it is important for us to understand that ultimately we are building the kingdom of God. We are a kingdom people. Honestly, it's one of the things I loved most about the Free Methodist Church. When I first, you know, Pam and I didn't grow up Free Methodist. We were part of another tribe. And one of the things that I love the most about the Free Methodists is that the Free Methodists weren't all about Free Methodism. They were about the kingdom. And I love that. So we want to be a kingdom people, ultimately. But we, there is a reason that God raised us up. I mean, someone asked us the question, what would, what would the world lose if there were no free Methodist kinds of disciples? I mean, honestly, if the answer to that is nothing, then we ought to join somebody else's movement. Because if we're not bringing something distinct to the whole, then we're missing our calling. So we also need to understand our unique identity as free Methodists within the whole kingdom, uh, within the whole kingdom, right? Now, let me just walk you through the quadrants here. The, the, let's go to the next slide. The first quadrant, well, first of all, so you see the low and the high. Uh, the bottom left quadrant is low in both kingdom and in faith tribe identity. Uh, the upper left is uh, high in kingdom identity but low in faith tribe. You get the picture there. So go to the next slide. The first one is this. We're going to call this disconnected indifference. And this is a group of people who honestly have no vision for the kingdom and no vision for understanding who they are as a faith tribe. Uh, th this is absolutely not where we want to be because this means basically we don't really have any idea who we are and we're not really living for anything bigger than ourselves, right? This is a local church that's basically just kind of consumed with itself and what it's doing with no sense of the kingdom and no sense of connection to other churches that are a part of the tribe. All right, go to the next slide. This is called noble ignorance. Noble ignorance. Now, the reason it's noble is because it's high in kingdom, and that's a really good thing. I mean, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just confess and tell you there was a time in my life where I was probably right there. I was high on kingdom and not so high on faith tribe identity, partly because we came out of one that was, that was not real healthy, and it was a bad experience. And so, you know, we just got real kingdom focused. And that's a, that's a good thing. But it, it, again, it leads to ignorance about why we as a tribe exist. There's no awareness. I mean, I think in a lot of ways, a lot of free Methodist churches have been in that quadrant. It's not a bad quadrant, but there's a better one, and we'll get to it in just a minute. The bottom left, I mean, the bottom right is uh, called, can we go to the last one? Devoted arrogance. 
uh, you may or may not be aware of this, but there are some tribes that are absolutely convinced they're the only ones that are going to be in heaven. I'm not calling any names, but there are some tribes that literally believe that they're the only ones going to heaven. They have no sense of the kingdom at all. They're completely loyal, 100% to their movement, but no sense of the kingdom at all. We don't want to be there. That's not where the free Methodist way is not meant to push us there. We don't want to go there. Where we want to end up is in this upper right quadrant, which is called gracious confidence. Gracious confidence. We know who we are. We, we, we embrace who God raised us up to be, but we love the kingdom. And we love everybody in the kingdom. We're not competing with other denominations. We can partner with other denominations. But we're also going to be who we're called to be. We're not going to become other denominations. I'll tell you, we've got a fair amount of people in, in our denomination who aren't there yet. That We're in uh, one of the other three somewhere. But this is where we all want to go. And the purpose of this document was to help us get there. So who are we so that we can understand this is why God raised us up, uh, but we still want to be a part of the kingdom, right? So the Free Methodist Way document, I want to walk us through this. And you've got, everybody should have a, a brochure at this point. Um, again, we have English ones and Spanish ones. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk through this, but I actually do want to Treat it almost like a creed. You know, we were talking in our breakout yesterday about the, the, the power of words, the power of our, of our own voice. When we speak things out, there's a power in that. There, there's there's a, a sense in which we're declaring something. And uh, I'd like to ask us, one at a time, to just read through and, and do it out loud. Now, I, it, it may sound a little bit like Pentecost, because we've got some people that are going to be reading it in Spanish, and we've got some people that are going to be reading it in English. Uh, I wish we had it in Creole. Unfortunately, we don't have that yet. Um, we'll get it soon. My brother just declared it right there. All right. So let me, let me say one more thing about the document as a whole. I'm not going to, we're not going to read this introduction, but it is important because here's what it says. What, I'm just going to tell you what it says. It says, first of all, we want to be a people who look both backward and forward. We're a people who understand why God raised us up in the beginning, in 1860. But we don't want to be stuck in 1860. We want to, here's the question we want to always be asking the Lord. Lord, what do you want to do today through us that's similar to what you did through that crowd back in 1860? I love this passage from Isaiah 43. Uh, where God says to the Israelites, forget the former things. Now, let me just say, he's talking about the parting of the Red Sea. That's the former thing he's actually saying, one of the highest moments in Israel's history. And God is saying, forget it. Now, there are other places where he clearly tells them to remember it. So here in Isaiah 43, he's telling them to forget it for a specific reason. And that is because they haven't left that moment. God says, I want to do something in you now, today. And your obsession with what happened here is keeping you from hearing and, and responding to what I want to do now. So we hold those two things in tension as well. We want to be uh, grounded in our history, but we don't want to be paralyzed by our history. We want to always be looking forward to say, God, what are you doing today? Uh, another point I'd like to make here is that Methodism as a whole, at least when you go back to Wesley, and I know that there are a lot of different forms of Methodism, and some of them don't look a lot like Wesley. We want to be a people that really are rooted and grounded in our Wesleyan heritage. And one of the unique aspects of Wesleyan theology was his ability to thread the needle and balance things that were often in tension. Thing, you know, for example, you know... Uh, let me just say it this way. The scripture, I, my conviction is that scripture never contradicts itself. But it has lots and lots of tension. For example, you know, is God sovereign or are we free? 
Yes. <laughs> you know, some things are mysterious. We can't fully explain it. But the Bible absolutely declares the sovereignty of God. And if we reject the sovereignty of God, we're going to miss half the Bible. But it also clearly declares the responsibility of individuals, the freedom and responsibility uh, to respond to what God has offered. Now, Calvin went this way. Arminius went that way. Wesley kind of brought them together. And Wesley said, yeah, we're, we believe in the sovereignty of God, but we also believe in the freedom of, of humanity. And he held them together. That's one example. We could, I, could, I could take all day and talk about tensions. You're going to see some tensions in the free Methodist way. And, and those tensions have to be there. Because uh, we're, what we're trying to say is we're, we don't want to be an either-or people when Scripture is clearly both and. Can I say that again? We don't want to be an either-or people when Scripture is clearly a both and. And so this document was very much meant to say, let's hold some things together that are not always easy to hold together, but we can't abandon one side because they're both biblical, right? And I will say, too, in, 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 in the spirit of that, it's important to understand that with the free Methodist way, kind of like the love chapter last night, it's not one or two, it's all five. If, we, if you pull any of these five out of the picture, you're missing something really important about what it means to be free Methodist. So we have to embrace all five. So let's look at the first one. And I do want us to read this together. Now, it's on the screen, but it's kind of small. So that's why I wanted you to have your, your brochure. You can read it off your brochure, or you can read it off the screen either way. But I'd like us to read this out loud together. God's call to holiness was never meant to be a burden, but a gift that liberates us for life that is truly life by delivering us from the destructive power of sin. All who are born again are made right with God by the finished work of Jesus Christ and called to experience the fullness of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Forgiven and filled, we approach life with confidence that we are acceptable to God even as he continues to transform our character and behavior to become more and more like Jesus. Life-giving holiness, then, is the fruit of full surrender to the loving reign of God over every aspect of our lives, establishing within us love that is truly love, leaving behind the legalism that once hindered our movement. The Free Methodist Way invites every believer to embrace the transforming work of the Holy Spirit that empowers us to love and serve God and others in joyful obedience. The Free Methodist Church has been a part of the holiness movement from the very beginning. Holiness is in our roots. It's a part of who we are. We, we have the audacity to believe that God can transform us here. And I, and I say that because there are some tribes, this is where we're different than some tribes. Have you ever seen that bumper sticker that says, I'm not perfect, I'm just forgiven? The, I mean, of course we're not perfect. In this, but the idea there is, I'm saved, but I ain't changing. I'm going to heaven when I die, but I'm not changing here on earth. We believe scripture clearly says that transformation should happen here. It doesn't happen all at once, but I'll tell you what, it starts all at once. It starts when we surrender and turn every part of our life over to the Lordship of the Holy Spirit and say, okay, Lord, transform me. We believe, we are a people of the Holy Spirit. We believe that the Holy Spirit lives in us and will begin to transform us as we surrender to his presence in our life. Now, I'll tell you that we're living in a day where the word holiness is not a popular word any longer. In fact, we've had people even in our own movement who said, you can't use that word because uh, it's, it's, it's too loaded. I, I'm a little stubborn when it comes to things like that. And my idea there is we cannot give up 
the word, because if we do, we'll give up everything that stands with the word. And the word holiness is a vital scriptural principle and value. Um, we just were asked to read um, early this year a new book that's coming out by Kevin Watson called Perfect Love. And Kevin Watson is a Wesleyan historian. He wrote this book. They were, copies were sent to us as bishops with the hopes that we would endorse it, and we did. It'll be coming out soon. But he makes the point. It's really interesting. He says when you look at anybody that traces their roots to Wesley and Methodism, and you look at it historically, Every time any group that calls themselves Methodists or Wesleyans has held on to this doctrine and proclaimed it with confidence, the movement has thrived. In every case where that, doc, where that value has been lost, the movement has paralyzed or degenerated. In every case, historically. This is a, this is, he's essentially saying we must recover this biblical idea of holiness. Now, part of the problem, one of the reasons that people react to the idea of holiness is because in some quarters, including our own, holiness was often attached to legalism. And let's just say it. We, we got to be transparent, right? We got to acknowledge our, um, this is, we're not going to blame displacement. We're going we're gonna to take responsibility for our own stuff here. And there was a time in our own history where we equated holiness with a long list of behavioral things, and we basically said, if you don't agree with all these things, you can't be a part of our people. You can't be a part of our movement. Everything was focused on external behavior. I, I'm so grateful. This happened before we came into the Free Methodist Church, and I don't know exactly, but my, my understanding is that at a general conference gathering, our leadership, say it again, Larry, 1995, the year before we came in as Free Methodists. So in 1995, at a, at a uh, Free Methodist general conference, the leadership of our denomination repented of legalism and said, we don't want to give up holiness, but we've got to get it free from legalism. Because it goes back to what I said earlier, we've got to trust the Holy Spirit to be at work transforming individuals if we say to people you can't be a part of us unless you look like this then we're putting them outside of the group we've got to bring them in and trust the holy spirit to transform them from within not from the outside but from within and then the outside will take care of itself so life-giving holiness is not legalism Life-giving holiness is rooted in this idea that God wants, yes, he does want to liberate us from the power of sin. But it's not just the negatives. It's not just the don'ts. It's all the do's. It's all the you get to's. Holiness is about you get to live the life that God designed you to live. When you focus only on the don'ts, it sends a message, basically, that most of life is, a, is, is, is not good. And you get a negative view toward life. We believe God, God created us in ways that reflect his nature and character. And when we live that way, we're most alive. And so we're calling people to life-giving holiness. But we want to be, I mean, this is a day where, uh, you know, we're, we're living in a time, we have to understand this, we're living in a time uh, where the only thing that's acceptable in our society, um, the only thing that's unacceptable in our society is to say that anything is wrong for everybody, right? Um, that's where we as free Methodists have to have some good self-differentiated leadership. And we're, we're saying we're not expecting the world to live our values, but we're going to live them. We're going to live them. And we're going to live them boldly, and we're going to live these values with confidence. So that's life-giving holiness. The second one is love-driven justice. Love-driven justice. So let's read this out loud together. Love is the way we demonstrate God's heart for justice by valuing the image of God in all men, women, and children, acting with compassion toward the oppressed, resisting oppression, and stewarding creation. We devote ourselves to our founders' deep convictions around matters of injustice as they took their stand against the evils of slavery, 
the oppression of the poor, the marginalization of women, and the abuse of power in the church. Our heart for justice continues and expands today, fueled by God's holy love for the unborn, the vulnerable, the oppressed, the marginalized, and people of all races and ethnicities. The free Methodist way is not only to realize a better society, but that all may be reconciled to God and one another in ways that reflect God's just character. Now, this is one of those places where there are two values that are being held together. The truth is that holiness has both a personal and a social component. I mean, Wesley is known for his famous saying about there is no holiness but social holiness. What he meant by that was that holiness that is purely private is not holiness at all. Holiness, if it changes who I am, it will by default change the way I relate to other people. It will change my understanding of relating to people, especially people who may be different than myself. Now, trust me, I know from great personal experience that this word justice has become a trigger word, right? I mean, there, there are some who will just say, I mean, some within the church who will just say, I don't want to, I'm, I'm not a part of that justice thing. That justice thing is socialism. That justice thing is Marxism. Uh, you know, I, you even say the word justice, and some people will declare you to be a Marxist. It, it's, it's the herd mentality. It's the reactionary. It's all that. Now, why are we as free Methodists saying we cannot give up justice? For two reasons. Number one, it's because we started, our movement began largely over issues of injustice. We said it's wrong to enslave people. And Christians ought to have the courage and the boldness to declare that it's wrong. We said it's wrong to, uh, to uh, discriminate against the poor. It's wrong to have uh, pews that are for sale so that the rich get to buy the front pews, which are the, the valuable ones, and all the poor can sit in the back where it's free. So you end up walking into a church in the 1800s, and you know immediately who's who. You know where the rich are and where the poor are. And we said, that's wrong. The Bible says God is not a respecter of persons. And the church ought to be the one place on the face of the earth where everybody stands on level ground, right? This is a part of our heritage. But more importantly, it's right out of Scripture. You cannot read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and fail to see the recurring theme of justice all the way through. Uh, I mean, we, Micah 3 8, let's bring that up, or 6 8, I'm sorry. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? I mean, God is saying here, this is God speaking through the prophet Micah. God is saying, if you want to know what I'm after, if you want to know what it really looks like to belong to me, you're going to love just, you're going to do justice, you're going to love kindness, and you're going to walk humbly with our God. There's another scripture. I don't think this one is on the overhead, but it's in Isaiah. It's a powerful scripture, Isaiah 51. The background is that the people of Israel have been, they've been praying, and the Lord doesn't seem to be acting. You know, they keep asking the Lord to deliver them, and the Lord isn't doing anything to deliver them. And they start crying out to God and saying, God, we've prayed and we've fasted, but, but you're not moving. You're not doing anything to change this situation. This is what God says to them. Is not this the fast I have chosen? Loose the bonds of wickedness. Undo the straps of the yoke. Let the oppressed go free. Break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? And bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh, then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. 
you shall cry out, and I will say, here I am. The Lord says, yeah, you're saying your prayers, and you're not eating food, but that's not what I'm looking for. Not that that's bad, that's good, if it leads to this. But this is what that's supposed to lead to. Now, some people might say, yeah, but all that's Old Testament. Well, first of all, we are people of both the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? Uh, we're not a people that pick and choose. Well, we, we're going to take this part of the Bible, but not that part of the Bible. We are both. But let me remind you that Jesus himself, when he came to this earth, he said two things that I want to highlight. He said, first of all, I came. This is kind of his mission. I came to seek and save the lost. Now, most of us who come from an evangelical background have no problem with that one. You know, we know we're about trying to reach the lost. But listen to what else he said about his mission from Luke 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus said, you want to know what I'm about? I'm about reaching the lost, and I'm about transforming. Through those people who are one, I'm about transforming society around them. I love this quote from John Wesley. This is, to me, one of Wesley's greatest quotes. I love it because we desperately need both sides of what he says here. He says, a scheme to reconstruct society which ignores the redemption of the individual is unthinkable. And a doctrine to save sinning men with no aim to transform them into crusaders against social sin is equally unthinkable. There's your both and. There's a lot of people in this world today, in our world today, who are saying all we should be about is redeeming the individual. And there are some within our movement who are saying, all we need to do is transform society. If you choose one without the other, you miss the gospel. It's about reaching the lost, seeing them transformed, and then we're going to live this out in the real world in ways that look like Jesus. That's what love-driven justice is. Now, let's look at the third one, uh, Christ-compelled multiplication. Let's read this one out loud. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the message he proclaimed, the life he lived, and the ministry he modeled set into motion a redemptive movement destined to fill the whole earth. Jesus' approach to discipleship was primarily a relational one in which he poured his life into a few with the full expectation that they would follow his example. His aim was not merely the transmission of information, but the transformation of lives by empowering those who followed him to do what he had been doing. His mission is now our mission. We believe this redemptive movement of multiplication applies to every believer and should permeate culture at every level. The found reaching the lost, Disciples making disciples, churches planting churches, and movements, movements. I had trouble with that one, and that's the one I wrote on. So anyway, I want to make a point here that applies to the whole, but it especially applies here because I want to remind us that these are values. This is not our mission. These are our values. That's really important because the mission is always to love God, love others, make disciples, right? That's our mission. These are values that define how we go about that. Now, the reason I emphasize that is because it's very important that we not turn the value into the mission. And if, if, you know, we can back up a minute. And if you turn holiness into the mission, you will tend to go toward legalism. Everything is about holiness. Everything is about, you know, this, living this holy life in ways that we define as holiness. That's what it becomes about. If you turn holiness into the mission, then you turn it into an idol. And it begins to be something that was never intended to be. Same thing with justice. This is one of the issues we're, we're wrestling with right now. We can't, justice is not the mission. 
Now, in some people's eyes, it is a mission. That's all we're about. And we're saying that can't be, that's not who we are as free Methodists. We love justice, and justice is going to shape everything we do, but it's not our mission. Now, that's true also with this one, multiplication, even though it's pretty closely tied to the mission. The mission is to make disciples. Well, multiplication is an important thing here, but we're saying it's of value. And the reason I emphasize that is because what we don't want is to get so focused on multiplication that we begin to measure effectiveness by numbers only. How many churches do we have? How many people do we have in our churches? Those kinds of things. It's a value that shapes the way we fulfill the mission. Now, it is a value, and it is something we want to, I mean, honestly, when we were writing this document, we said, okay, are we going to be... Uh, Are we going to reflect who we are or who we want to be? And again, we tried to do both. We wanted to say this is who we've been and this is who we want to be. But there are some of these that we freely acknowledge are more aspirational. And this is the one that's the most aspirational of all, I think. The truth is, and it's not just free Methodists, it's, it's, it's American Christianity. We have lost this value of multiplication. Because what's at the heart of multiplication is relationship. So you can add people by just doing a good marketing campaign. You can draw a bunch of people in and add them by just marketing and trying to draw them in and not ever really have a, a direct connection relationally. Isn't it fascinating that the Son of God came to earth. He's God, right? I mean, he created the whole universe in seven days, seven words. He could have done it any way he wanted to do it. I mean, even in the first century, he, he could have, you know, he, he could have created the internet overnight, right? He could have created social media overnight if he wanted to. God could have done it any way he wanted to do it. Jesus came and he spent the vast majority of his three years in ministry with 12 people. He poured his life deeply into a few with the confidence that because he was investing deeply, the transformation would happen deeply, and they would then go and do what he did. The early church grew mostly not by large churches, but through one disciple reaching one disciple, giving himself or herself to that one disciple, and then that one doing the same. It was a a principle of multiplication. And, And we have seen how Jesus started with 12 And within several centuries, there are millions. The multiplication value works. But it is highly focused on relationship. And I'll say this as a pastor, a former pastor of this church. uh, You know, we pastored this church for 21 years. And uh, uh, we, we believe discipleship was very important. And we were always looking at how do we disciple our people. But I'll tell you that as I got toward the end of that 21 years, I began to be concerned that we had lost our focus on intentional life-on-life discipleship. Uh, We we began to believe that if we, if I preach the gospel on Sunday morning, preach the word on Sunday morning, and if we can get people in small groups, and if we can get people plugged into ministry, discipleship will happen. It's what I would call the organic approach to discipleship. Now, let me just say, I believe in the organic power of discipleship. Now, I believe that, you know, parents, your influence on your kids is more about who you are and the way you live 24-7 than it is every little thing you've ever taught them. And the same thing, you, for those who are hungry, for those who are self-starters, what I just described can make disciples, but I believe we began to talk about this before I left. I said, we've, we've got to get back to this focus on life-on-life discipleship because there are so many people sitting in our pews that, that are, they don't know how to do it. They don't know what it looks like, and they need somebody to connect with them. But the, one of the greatest tragedies of what I've described is that it sends the message to every person in the pew that you're not necessary in terms of making disciples. We'll do that through a program. We'll do that through these large programs. 
what we've got to recover is that every one of you and every person in your church is called to be a disciple maker. We've got to recover that. It's been lost largely in the American church. Uh, by the way, we've got Eric and Virginia Spangler here. I, I meant to introduce you at the very beginning. Would you just stand up for a minute? These are our area directors of Asia. And they're here today because they're meeting with the Doblins this weekend. Uh, they're from Seattle, and they lead all of the work in Asia. Thank you for being here. I want to tell you... <clears throat> We had a chance to work with them early on in our term, and it was one of the highlights of the early months of our term. What's going on in Asia is just absolutely beautiful and wonderful. And in many parts of the world, they've got this because they don't have the big buildings. They don't have the big programs. The only way they can do it is life on life. Ask ourselves this question. It's a hard question, but we've got to ask it. Why has the Free Methodist Church, I wish I had, I should have brought this statistic, but if you look back at our history, Free Methodist Church grew very, very fast in the first 40 years, largely because we were doing a lot of disciple making. And then we have been plateaued essentially since 1900. The world stayed here until around the 50s. And all of a sudden, it took off. And now the U.S. is only 7% of the Free Methodist population. The world... Free Methodist Church is growing rapidly. And we have to ask the question, why are they growing so fast and we're plateaued? I'm really convinced that at the heart of it, it's multiplication. It's this commitment to discipleship and to reproducing leaders. Leadership is nothing more than advanced discipleship. Leader is just, leadership is just taking somebody who's got the gifts of leadership and discipling them toward leadership. Leadership development, churches planting churches, movements birthing movements. This is what we're after in Christ compelled multiplication. Number four, cross cultural collaboration. Let's just read that out loud. <clears throat> from the beginning, God's intent was to have a people from every nation, culture, and ethnicity united in Christ and commissioned to carry out his work in the world. Today we celebrate the beauty of a multicultural and multi-ethnic church, both in the U.S. and in over a hundred countries around the world. In the U.S., we cling to the promise that we have been made one in Christ, even as we dedicate ourselves to becoming a more diverse church that looks like the kingdom of God. Globally, we continue to send missionaries to other nations even as we rejoice that the nations are increasingly coming to us, freely sharing our own gifts and resources. We are also challenged and inspired by the faithfulness, perseverance, ceaseless prayer, theological insights, and spiritual wisdom of our international brothers and sisters. Without question, we are better together. The Free Methodist Way aspires to move beyond colonialism, and ethnocentrism in favor of a collaborative partnership in God's global work in anticipation of the day when a great multitude from every tongue, tribe, people, and language makes up the eternal throng before the throne of God. That's cross-cultural collaboration. Now, we initially began to look at that one primarily from the global standpoint. And what we wanted to say very strongly is that we have this incredible opportunity to live out all of Acts 1-8 right now. Uh, I mean, there have been very few generations in the history of the world uh, who, could, uh, who could literally be involved in making disciples, using this metaphorically, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. What Jesus described there in Acts 1-8 was an ever-increasing uh, movement out from the center to the whole world. We have the opportunity right now to be a part of the global effort to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's an amazing privilege. It's an amazing opportunity. And we want to encourage every free Methodist church, every free Methodist, to be aware of and to be looking for ways to partner with our global Free Methodist Church. 
And it's not just because they need us. Here's what partnership does. Partnership says they have as much to give us as we have to give them. We need to learn from them as much as we can offer them what we have. So as free Methodists, we have completely rejected this idea that our goal is to make every Christian in the world look like Americans. We're not trying to make American Christians. We're just trying to make disciples. We want Thai, you know, Thai, we want Thai disciples and Vietnamese disciples and uh, Iraqi disciples. We want disciples who, uh, who look like a disciple in their own culture. Uh, so we are committed to that as God's people. We want to learn from our international brothers and sisters as much as we are giving to them. But it also has implications right here in the U.S. Because, again, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know, but you look around the U.S., and if you look at the vast majority of churches in the U.S., they are monocultural, monoracial. There is very little diversity in most of our churches. Now, I'll tell you that some of that goes back, well, I mean, that's been around for, from the beginning of, of our time as, as, a, as a nation. But there was a time even in my early ministry when there was this principle of the gr church growth movement called the homogeneous principle. And the idea there was if you, re if you will try to reach people who are like you, you will grow much faster than if you reach people who are not like you. Now, if you think about it, it makes sense. I mean, it, it makes sense from a natural standpoint because it's easier to connect with people who already think the way you think, who look the way you look, who shop at the same places you shop, went to the same schools you went to. You have lots of affinity there because you're alike. And so naturally, it is easier to grow a church by reaching people who all are alike. But where we would push back on that is to say that is not a kingdom principle. That's not a biblical principle. The biblical principle is God calls us to come together. And here's the beauty of, of unity in diversity. And I do want to emphasize that. We're not talking about diversity for diversity's sake. We're not turning diversity into the mission. What we're saying is we must be united around some core beliefs or we don't have unity. We have to agree on the essentials. But we can be different on the non-essentials. And we're actually better off if we're together with those differences around those essentials. Because we learn from each other things that we would never learn if we were only around people that look like us. It's, it's one of the most beautiful discoveries. I mean, I grew up in an all-white church. And, uh, you know, I, I was in a, a town that was multiracial. I went to a public school. But you know what? The, the, the connection we had at school never left the schoolyard. We didn't hang out with each other on the weekends, and we sure didn't go to church together. We were, co we were separate but equal in every way in, in when I was growing up. One of the greatest experiences and discoveries of our life is learning the beauty of unity and diversity. I'll never forget, it was a businessman that said this. It was a, I think he was a, uh, the CEO of, of MasterCard. And someone asked him, or someone made this statement to him. It was in a Q&A session. He said, you're known for having a very diverse corporate leadership team. He says, why, why do you do that? Is there really value in diversity? Or is it just something you're doing because it looks good? And he said... If you're around the same people all the time, you have no one to show you your own blind spots. The only way you can see your blind spots is through somebody else who's able to see them and loves you enough to help you see them. And you see, that's what the church ought to be. The church ought to be a place where we're coming together and not trying to conform everybody into one shape but celebrating the beauty of our differences. There's beauty in racial diversity. There, there's beauty in cultural diversity. As long as we can agree on the essentials, we get to learn from each other because there are things that I absolutely cannot understand because I've never lived them. I've never experienced them. But someone else who has can at least help me to have compassion and understanding. And I need that person 
to help me see what I can't see. This is such a huge thing right now because our world is so divided over these issues. And we as a people must say we're not going to get sucked into either side of that herd mentality. We're not going for diversity for diversity's sake, but we're also not going for everything that looks like that is bad because some people over here do it wrong. I don't know who said this. I can't remember where it came from, but they said the misuse of a thing does not negate the proper use of that thing. Just because someone else has done it wrong doesn't mean we can't do it right. There's more than two options, do it wrong or don't do it at all. There's a third option, do it right. And that's what we want to do and be as a people called Free Methodists when it comes to cross-cultural collaboration. Last one is God-given revelation. And let me just say, by the way, the reason it's last is not because it's the the least important. It's the foundation of the whole. Everything rests on this one. Everything is defined by this one. God-given revelation. Let's uh, read it together. We hold unwaveringly to our conviction that the Bible is the inspired word of God and our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Drawing on our Wesleyan heritage of engaging with Scripture through the lenses of tradition, reason, and experience, we keep Scripture primary. While the church will always be tasked with authentically communicating and applying biblical truths with sensitivity to cultural dynamics, We do not subjugate the Bible's timeless truths to cultural norms or social trends. The Free Methodist way is to fully align our lives and our movement on the unshakable foundation of God's Word. Amen? Again, one of the brilliant uh, aspects of Wesley's theology was that he did understand that things like experience and history and reason are important. But Wesley always insisted that the Bible was held primary. We don't define the Bible through experience. We may understand some things in Scripture through experience, but we don't define it through experience. One of the challenges of of modern Wesleyanism is that in many corners, all four of those have been at at best, leveled, and they're all in the same playing field. And if experience is strong enough, well, experience can overrule Scripture. We as free Methodists say that's not where we're going to be. We're going to hold to our Wesleyan roots, and we're going to say, yes, we love history, we love experience, we love reason, but we will always hold Scripture primary. Scripture will always be our ultimate authority. Uh, Here's a quote from Wesley. I think it's on the next one. I want to know one thing, the way to heaven, how to land safe on that happy shore. God himself has condescended to teach me the way. For this very end, he came from heaven. He has written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. I have it. Here is the knowledge, enough for me. Let me be homo unius libre, libre, a man of one book. We are people of the word. We're not compromising the word. We have to let the word shape everything we just talked about. And so we are people of the book. Now, this is a huge issue on a number of levels. I mean, one is what I just shared, that that increasingly uh, we live in a postmodern context where uh, there is a rejection of the idea of absolute truth, that all truth is relative, And as long as you believe it strongly and you've got strong convictions about it, your truth is as good as anybody else's. Uh, That's a secular humanistic worldview that does not define who we are. We are people who say, I have to be shaped by God's word, first and foremost. But here's the second problem. The second problem is that we as Christians don't know our word. Everybody that surveys the church says that we are the most illiterate biblical generation in history, which is incredibly ironic because we have Bibles everywhere, even on your phone. You can access the Bible anytime, anywhere, but we're not actually reading it. 
And that's the problem because what happens is we get in these conversations theologically and people are talking about things that have no idea what the word actually says. Uh, they take things out of context. We take things out of context. I shouldn't be pointing my fingers. We're all guilty of this. We will take things out of context and ignore the whole counsel of Scripture by focusing on my own interpretation of a single verse. Uh, it is we, How can we live as biblical people when we don't know the Word? We, we must be a people who are deeply devoted to reading, and not just reading, but letting the Word shape us. Someone said, the, word, the, the Bible is the only book I've ever read that read me first. And it does. I mean, that's scriptural, right? God's word is living and active. It transforms everything it touches. We must be a people of the word of God. Amen? Now, I didn't leave you much time. But we have a few minutes. And I just wonder if, for a moment, is, is there anybody that would say, I've got a question about this. This is not open question time, but about the free Methodist way. Does anybody would say, I don't understand this or I don't understand that. Anybody have a question about what we've just talked about? Yes. Yes. Thank you. The slides? Sure. Absolutely. Yes. In, in fact, I can't give you, I don't know, is this recorded? If it's recorded, you're welcome to have it. Um, I, we'll record it somewhere at some point, but... Um, you're going to get, as a pastor, you should get a whole packet. It'll be an email that comes, or you can go to the website. Actually, you don't have to wait. Just go to the website. If you go to the fmcusa.org, on the front page, it's covered with Free Methodist Way stuff, and there's a place that says resources. You can click on that link, and it will give you slides. It'll give you brochures. It'll give you uh, everything. It'll give you articles. Um, you can purchase this book, as we said, and use it in your churches. You can get these. If you want to get these brochures, um, we've given you all one, but you can get them from uh, Light and Life Publications. I think they're like $15 for 25, uh, $15 for 25 brochures. Uh, you can order them from the website. Um, we, will, we will try to get as much as we can because we do feel this is really critical for us right now as a movement. And um, I, I think I'm hearing you say, yes, we're in agreement. Are we in agreement? Yes. This is who we want to be as a free Methodist people. It's called gracious confidence. We're not arrogant. We're, we don't believe we're the only ones that have all the truth. We're ready to learn from others, but we are very confident in a gracious way with this idea that God raised us up for a reason. And we need to recapture that sense of what God raised us up to be. Because I believe, I believe with all my heart that our message is for this time. Everything we've just talked about, our world desperately needs to hear. I think we have an opportunity as free Methodists, if we can live this out, to truly impact our nation impact our communities, impact the worlds that we live in. And it's important that we give ourselves deeply to what this is, is calling us to. Yes? Can you please preview right from the message that I'm going to be giving you this week? I won't tell you the whole thing, but I just want to have a sneak peek of what you're going to talk about. In 1860, I think it was... Yeah, the problem with that is those dates are wrong because we didn't exist until 1860. And these dates are pre-1860. But the point is, what you're sharing there, Rudy, is the point is we grew very rapidly in the early days, and partly because we were focused on our mission and we lived out our values. And we grew rapidly in the first 40 years. I mean, we're, just, we're having to own the truth. You can't get better until you own the truth. 
And the truth of the matter is we have been plateaued for 120 years as a movement. Uh, and it's not about numbers, but it is about numbers because every number represents a person, right? We want to reach people. We want to impact this world that we live in. And so we do want to see us growing again. We believe that if we will focus on our mission and live these values, we'll do that. One. Yeah, the book in Spanish absolutely is coming. In fact, I thought we already had it. If you look on the website, it may be there. But if we don't have it yet, it's definitely coming. Because uh, I know we were committed to getting the brochures and the book in Spanish, so it's coming. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So Pam, if you could, couldn't hear Pam, she was saying, we will commit. We've given you all a copy in English today. But if you're a Hispanic church, or, uh, we will get you at one in Spanish uh, as soon as we're able, and we'll make sure you get those. Mike, we'll make sure we get them to you, and there you are, and you can get them to those churches, okay? Yes. Yeah, no, right, uh, Ray. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it is important to know our history and to know those freedoms. But I will say this. That's one of the reasons we wrote this document. Is uh, the, When we heard, first of all, there were six freedoms, and then there were four, and then there were five. The numbers kept changing. Um, but the problem with that was that most of those freedoms were focused on one value. It's an important value, but most of those freedoms are focused on justice. And we want to be a justice people, but that's not all we are. We're more than that. So we have very intentionally tried to expand this picture of this is who we are. It's not just about those freedoms. It's also about all this. But it's, we're not doing away with that. We're not, we're, we're not trying to get away from that heritage. We want to build on that heritage with these values. And, and I will say, we did, you'll have to look carefully, but every one of those values is captured in this document. Uh, they just don't have the word free there. Uh, so the idea is captured in the document with everyone. Now, we're going to do this because our time is almost up. We've got three minutes. But I think this is, it's really important that we take these last three minutes. And I'm just going to ask you, right where you are in groups of four or five, would you just gather with whoever's around you, four or five people, and would you take these last three minutes to just pray that God would help us to live out who he called us to be? That we would recapture our mission clearly and we would live out these values in ways that bring him glory and expand his kingdom. Would you do that right now? Just begin to gather right where you are. <laughs> 